Welcome back to another episode of Ballroom Chat, the podcast dedicated to sharing the dance journey. I'm your host, Samantha, with Love Live Dance. Today, I'm joined by Yuri Kravitz. He was awarded the Master of Sport of Ukraine from Lviv State University of Physical Culture for his performance in ballroom dancing as an amateur and then professional. After he turned professional, he represented Ukraine at the World and European Championships for a number of years, and then eventually moved to the U.S. and began his work as a professional dance instructor through Fred Astaire before going independent. Uh, He's currently teaching and competing with Pro-Am students based in Denver, Colorado, although he has students all across the country. And I had a chance to sit down and chat with him today about his journey from amateur to professional from Ukraine to the United States, and everything in between. So please enjoy my conversation with Yuri Kravitz. Well, thank you, Yuri, so much for being a guest on today's podcast. My pleasure. So um, the question that I, I kind of like to start with all of my guests is, how did you get into the dance industry? Where did your dance journey start? Uh, my dance journey started in Ukraine. My older brother, who also happened to be dance instructor right now, uh, he started earlier and he really got involved into that and he decided, okay, my brother also will go and dance. So at that time I was 13 years old and my brother was probably 25. And <clears throat> so he started a bit earlier and then we danced basically together, but he started to be a bit more known faster than me. And so then we actually, even though we're brother, we rarely practice together because he was always traveling and coaching and this and then lived in different countries. But he was the one who introduced me to ballroom dancing. Okay. So did that a uh, little bit of sibling rivalry encourage you then to uh, train harder and compete harder? How did you kind of get from I'm going to take dance lessons because my older brother's taking dance lessons to, no, I think I'm going to be a professional dance, professional ballroom well, dancer. I think it was the good because we had some gap in age. So when I was dancing, it was either the level was not there or then age. So because we have different. So when he will become Ukraine national champion, I'm still was dancing in the youth. So then it was a little bit harder, but some competition we do dance together and was fun. Of course, it's for me was always to have brother to look up to him. And of course, always like, okay, maybe one day I'm gonna dance to that level. And, but it was not always that I had in mind, okay, I have to be better. It just was somebody to share it with. And also he was guiding me through the his journey, how he did. So he introduced me to different coaches and we went together to different competition, even though we danced in the different groups. And so that was a lot of fun okay. to have a brother in that. Yeah. And then at some point you become a champion dancer yourself. You're representing Ukraine and the world and European championships. Um, were you dancing 10 dance at that time? Had you specialized in either Latin or standard? What were you dancing at that moment? I was dancing 10 dances, but then later when I started dancing more and more and more, so it was a choice given, okay, you have to do this or this because there was not much time in 24 hours. So then I switched to dancing just ballroom. And um, for a little bit I danced 10 dances and I also was representing Ukraine in 10 dances and uh, but later only ballroom. Okay. Until I get to the United States, now I dance all four styles. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, as soon as you start dealing with the pro-am uh, experience in the US, it's like I, I now dance everything. Um, so, I want to talk a little bit about kind of the structure of of dance and dance sport in Ukraine. Um, when I had Boyko on, he was talking about the fact that in Bulgaria you could actually study and get a um, a advanced college degree or university degree in ballroom dancing up until a certain point, and then they kind of phased that out. Um, we were talking a little bit before we started recording 
that you were awarded this master of sport. So can you tell me a little bit about what the dance sport industry is kind of structured like in Ukraine and how that um, is intertwined with the education system? Well, it's actually, I would say that normally when we start to dance in Ukraine, we always start very early, especially right now. When I started, I started at 13 age. My brother started after 20, which at that time was okay. But now it's so many young kids, like five, six years old, they're already dancing. I don't even know what they're going to dance when they're going to be growing up. So, and after that, they have some choices to actually continue their education if they want to become not just only professional dancers, it does not require actual, actual education, but if they want to be more educated in, as a, let's say, get bachelor or continue in that uh, way, so they can go to the university and there is few in Ukraine. And after that, you just get in just a regular education, but your physical education, or bachelor or master. Okay. And then when people competing, so then they can be recognized as a sportsman. So same like, let's say Olympic, they have certain grades and the same for the ballroom dance in Ukraine, you can get a master of the uh, sport of Ukraine or international master of sports at different levels too. Interesting. So it sounds like um, the the kind of structure behind either the levels or um, the graduation through the different levels is much more um, formalized and um, kind of uniformly held um, in Ukraine versus what we have here in the U.S. Would you agree with that or do you see there being a little bit of difference uh, to my knowledge yes but there is maybe some other university which i don't know so you can basically can get state recognized education and a degree okay. so and if, let's say you want to work with the kids in the school and just specialize in the ballroom dancing that's possible too interesting so um, at some point you moved to the U.S. I was kind of reading a little bit about your history and it sounds like your first job in the U.S. was through Fred Astaire franchise. Is that correct? Yes. So how did that come to be? How did that whole transition happen for you? Uh, well, I met uh, some friends from Fred Astaire and then I started to work there. So it was quite different transition because at that time in Ukraine, the program was something never heard about. So that was totally different. And first time I saw it when I went to uh, USDC at that time. And I saw it kind of a mixed feeling, I guess, <laughs> for the person who is only working, dancing either professional, professional, or MM, or just with the kids as a couple. So I started at first year, and I worked for a couple of years. And that's when I get a little bit more emerged into that opera M, learning different style. Let's say smooth was my second style and probably rhythm was my last one. So, and that transition is always, I would say it takes time because sometimes we are kind of resistant to the changes. So I'm, let's say myself, I know that it's my first always idea was I was gonna teach only international style and this is it. And a lot of people actually do that. Mm -hmm. And some people are just become more diverse and starting to learn different styles, especially if they open minded. So I think it's great opportunity. Yeah. And also as I work in, I can see that people like different styles. Sometimes they like to have all four styles and then you have something to offer always in that case. Yeah, um, I want to talk a little bit more about that, just your, your own experience and, and kind of my experience with this idea that, you know, if you want to be successful, especially with beginner students, you kind of have to have at least a basis in all four of the main categories. Um, definitely do have instructors that specialize where they say, you know what, I, I am a Latin dancer through and through, and that's my home base, and that's what I'm going to teach. Um, I personally see the benefit of learning all four styles as being able to find connections between them. And then at a certain point, I'm like, you know what? I'm not 
I'm not a world champion standard dancer, but I know people that are, so I can kind of put you in that direction if you get to that level. So um, what do you kind of see as the benefit of going ahead and doing all four of those styles rather than, like you said, just saying, you know what, I was a 10 dancer, I'm going to teach 10 dance. I would totally agree with you that it's better to have all styles at least to start with the students so they can actually decide. But usually what I see with my experience, because students are leaning toward toward the teacher like. So if the teachers are, let's say, international Latin, so more likely they start to feel that they, are, they want to do that because they want to do what their teacher um, do. And usually students are admiring their teacher and I guess that's why they actually taking lesson from them, right? And so that's usually that's for that way. And of course, if somebody wants to continue in different style and there is a possibility in the city, I'm, I don't mind if some my student will dance the other style with somebody who has created that. Yeah. So that's what. So do you think that the average student that walks in the door is seeking out an instructor based on their reputation in a given style? Or do you think that they are molded into a certain style because of the reputation of the teacher? I would say that if we talk about complete beginner, they don't know. They don't even know sometimes what actually they want to do. They just want to learn something for different reason. Say moving exercises, just some new hobby. And let's say for myself, I always like to introduce in different styles so the person can learn different dances and then see, okay, I actually have inclination for this one. It's, and usually it's either Latin style or just ballroom style. So it's either they like to move their body a lot or they actually like to stay more with the teacher or in a close hold and be a little bit more, feel like a princess, I guess, <laughs> or a queen. <laughs> and that's basically their choice, what they like to do, I think. Yeah. And when the student had already danced for a while, so they actually know what they want. So then they come to the teacher just because what he's doing. Mm -hmm. So then for them, it's matter who is their teacher. But if the beginner, they don't really mind to dance with any teacher and then later if they become competitive dancers they might think about to change teacher of course it's a very painful process and i understand it but if somebody wants to be the best in the best so then of course they're trying to change partners same way like a professional amateur are changing yeah, that's a, that's an interesting thing that you just brought up. So um, I was I forget which guest we were talking about this on, but uh, the conversation had previously come up that um, instructors probably need to be a little bit less precious or protective or or onerous about their students, and students should feel empowered to switch instructors if either the instructor that they're working with isn't a good fit or if they have goals that their instructor can't necessarily meet. So um, do you really look at the at the, the instructor and student relationship similar to you, how you would with an amateur, amateur or a professional professional relationship where, you know, it's uh, tryout based, we wanna make sure that we're moving in the same direction, we wanna make sure that we're having the same goals and then if suddenly there's um, a schism, we need to go ahead and, and break apart and find different people to work with. It can be, can be a scenario for that. But usually it's not as dramatic unless, you know, usually people are finding the way to coordinate there in, if they are both have flexibility, especially let's say on the both sides. It's not really like if student is demanding, then no teacher wants to teach them in a sense, demanding unreasonably. And then when the teacher is too demanding unreasonably, there is no, no fun for the student because I think it's also important to have, um, to enjoy the dancing, either you professional or amateur. 
and I think the professional they should guide their students to the to the wherever they decide to be their goal. If they want to be on the top, so that's the teacher goal to do that. Yeah. Are you working with mostly competitive ladies right now? Are you working with kids? Are you working with social students? What does kind of your average day look like as far as students go? Right now, my right in the United States, I'm working only with adults. So I don't have any classes with kids. Somehow it didn't work out that way. But back in Ukraine, I was working only with the kids. So that's in Ukraine is different because mostly at that time only kids were dancing. So the parents were bringing the kids and staying at the door, making sure the kids not leaving, <laughs> and doing all what teacher said. So once I moved here, it's everything has changed. So I become I started to work with adults, and yes, all my students say ninety percent are competitive dancers. Nice. They like that. When they first walked in the door, were they competitive students or were they social students that have now caught the dancing bug and want to compete? Some of them, yes. Yeah, some just wanted to learn, but I think it's a process also. I don't think that student, I mean, majority of the students never come and say, okay, I want to compete. I don't know any steps yet. I don't even know what the name of the dance is. But once they are exposed to the competition, they're like, oh, I like it. Well, often it's, let's say, just go in the competition, see the energy of the competition, see their friends dancing and see themselves being on the side, like, okay, next time it's my turn. So it's kind of over that way. Yeah. So something that we, I don't think we have really talked yet about the, about on the podcast is making that transition, um, both from a like student mindset walking in the door saying, this is a hobby. I saw it on Dancing with the Stars. I want to feel like a queen. I just want to have fun to no, this is something that I want to actually like be on the road and compete and try and get that goal. Um, and also from the instructor mindset about how do you convert someone that is a social student to a competitive student? And how do you kind of like navigate when and how and where to bridge that gap. So for you, um, what does a typical conversation look like when you have a student, they've expressed interest, they're progressing, you're like, you know what, I, I can see the spark in this person. So let's, let's kind of test the water and see if that's something they'd be interested in. I think that first it's always start from person actually attending competition as a just audience. Mm -hmm. So they look how it's look like, then they probably have the chat with their friends who are already dancing. And so far, let's say, I would say that every student I met and they compete, they always love it. So they are definitely always recommending. And for me, I always say, okay, it might or might not be your part of tea. But if you try, you know for sure if it is or not. So usually it's a small competition and kind of comfortable and definitely not USDC when you have so many competitors, all the best and they're super competitive. So that will be probably a little bit too much for the first time. So it's always start with a smaller competition just to have get comfortable. And of course you want to put your student into environment which it's fit them. So if they are only starting, of course, they better start with people who are starting so they feel comfortable. And as they progress, well, usually after first competition, they ask in where the second one. <laughs> so it's not really much of guiding. Okay, let's do it, let's do it. So usually people like it and they feel and the every queen needs a dress, right? And it's a, so perfect opportunity to actually do that so all these dresses are just amazing and everybody wants that yeah that is that is something that i definitely miss um i have not ventured into the in-person competition realm yet uh since the pandemic started but i am desperately missing being in a room and smelling nothing but hairspray and fake tan and seeing okay. all of the glitzy dresses <laughs> it's a weird thing to miss but but i do um we were talking a little bit earlier that you had just gotten back from beach bash um 
was that your first competition back with students or have you been able to do a couple of other competitions? Uh, a couple before. And I would say that each batch was nicely organized and organizers are taking care of them, making sure that everything is safe, everybody wears the mask. So I think this is, I think it's also important from the point of student, if they are not sure, then knowing that everybody will wear mask, maybe not only when dancing, it kind of gives a little bit, a little bit peace of mind that, that okay, at least everybody wear mask. So when the competition is where it's not really forced, I think it's from that point is not so easy for students to decide to go because you know nobody wants to get sick and usually for M students is already grow up. Yeah. So they are not the kids. And of course they care about their health. So I think at that point from any from me as a competitor, I would say I appreciate if they let's say if they check the temperature once a day. It's kind of nice. Of course, when you go in right of the practice room, then you all sweat and you have to do temporary check. Like, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where's where's the large fan that I can just stick my face in front of to cool down? <laughs> Yeah, but I think it's it's possible to do it and see it's working. Yeah, yeah, and and as the as we progress into summer and more people get their vaccinations and and things start um, hopefully calming down and we don't mm -hmm. see another spike, yeah. um, that that means that hopefully we we can return to more normalcy, which I feel like at this stage in the game we're all kind of begging and and ready for. Um, so the, the way that you and I know each other is through the Bariki Institute. Um, so what, uh, what first got you interested in kind of that methodology and uh, how do you kind of shape your instruction based on not just the technique book, right? Not just the blue book, not just... Um, the syllabus, but also thinking about now working with older individuals and making sure that you, as you are progressing through your own dancing, are doing it um, with as much information and knowledge as possible. Well, I think it's, it's a very good addition to just Blue Book, like you said. So, and I think it's, that's when it become very actually handy. So when I was dancing, it was the actual probably the same time like Luca was dancing. So it's always at the same time and you always look up for the current champion. So it was always inspirational. And then when he retires, it's always, it's, I actually had a couple lessons with him. So that was, he was always inspiring in the lessons. And um, so I was following what he's doing. He was doing some video production. So that was interested at that time. And when this institute came, I tried in person in the private lessons and I really enjoy it. And then as I get a bit more involved into that, I really uh, enjoy to develop it. And right now I'm trying to work with the students with this. And it's a great addition to technique for sure, because it um, allows person to actually feel their body, which I, think is a bit lack of that for the students who are starting in the, um, how would I say that, other, uh, in the higher uh, stage of their life. Yeah. They've, they've had previous <laughs> life experience. They, <laughs> not when they're not kids anymore, because when kids have the natural ability and they respond and pick up all the movements basically instantly. For the adults, since we are already thinking so much, when we dance and how to do it, it's often the image of the dance makes person actually not using their body mm -hmm. as it's supposed to do. And uh, let's say all profession, good professionals and amateur couple, they already have it in their body. So through the different way to do it. So they discover where they are in the space rather than uh, pro M students, they are actually looking for that but not always is possible for them to find it. And I think this, what this Bariki Institute is offering is uh, it's a good way 
if instructor uses this, it's just great. Yeah, it's um, my experience with it has been interesting. So um, I really love the concept behind it, and I love the information that that we're learning through it. Um, I'm kind of looking at it and through the lens of a how to make sure that you know I'm teaching my student, my older students, in a way that is going to be to their long-term benefit and not create more problems for them later on. But also it's kind of reshaping my own awareness of how little we normally teach about body awareness. Mm -hmm. um, to your point, if you're working with kids, I feel like, okay, they just, they mimic the movement, they know it, they can feel it, they've got it. Um, but I don't feel like even in when I was growing up in ballet, I ever had an instructor go, okay, where is your spine? Be aware of your spine. How, you know, when you're, when you're taking your hand into first position, how are, how is that timing be, you know, linked with your plie? It was just, okay, I watch it. So then I mimic the movement and I've got it so I can do it. Um, so when you are teaching now, are you going back and thinking about how much we've previously missed in previous discussions, or are you just taking it as an opportunity to say, okay, this is where I'm at, so moving forward, this is how I'm going to teach it? Well, I think it's every dancer has own experience through their own bodies, mm -hmm. and of course, I would say if that information would be available earlier, it would help me for sure. I definitely can see benefits even now as I am developing all the skills I still have is changing my perception of the movement and also how do I feel when I move. Mm -hmm. So, and I think it would be great if it would be there, but everything comes at the some certain time. So it's all, all, it's already here, that's great. And now I'm just using it yeah. as I'm learning as well. And I would say that all students I'm trying with, they are quite satisfied and it's actually nothing super hard. Yeah. It's quite easy, actually quite natural. Just bring the awareness to own body. Yeah, um, I feel like, um, and I'm very excited to move to, to move forward uh, and get more information. Um, but I feel like from an instructor standpoint, um, between technique certifications, or I, sh or I should really say syllabi certifications, physical therapy, understanding the human body, biomechanics, psychology of movement. These are all topics that I feel like as the industry progresses, we're having more conversations about, but no one really wants to say, if you're going to be an instructor, the expectation is to do, you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, we were talking a little bit before about kind of the structure in Ukraine and there being a little bit more emphasis put on if you want to do dance education, here is a track in order to do that. Do you see something like a standardized education process for instructors ever happening in the U.S.? Or do you think because we've all kind of got our own thing going on, it would be difficult to do? I think everybody has own agenda on that <laughs> subject. <laughs> Well, I think it's why it's in a sport is easier because, well, it's Olympics. There is the whole set of the different organizations are behind that. It's a, probably a lot of funding involved into that. So, and it's on the government level. So it's a prestige of the country to win in the Olympic. And also I would say, in, Olymp in Olympic sports, it already probably exists and psychology of everything of the sport, how to compete. The biomechanic is developed in that way that let's say they take in slow motion of the world champion and then they analyze in their mechanic and then, then have the athlete practicing. So they do the same and see, okay, here you're missing and da 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 da. 
and that's how they're improving. So it's a lot of science and a lot of people involved. And there is like, I would say maybe pyramid in Valdez. But in the ballroom dance, I think it's more like flat. So meaning in the sense of the everybody functions independently and, um, and probably until that point, maybe will not happen. So I think everybody will, well, right now, yeah. as 2021. So I think it's, this is what it is. So every teacher has own way to do it. Otherwise it's, I don't, don't even imagine how it would, how long would it take to actually make it happen. Even let's say right now, not every dance instructor is certified with the old, any of the organizations. So it's sometimes that also the issue. So thinking about kind of the analogy that you're making with Olympic sport, um, do you think that is a athlete driven move? Do you think that's a country and uh, national pride driven move? What, what progresses in industry such as ours to become more unified in its direction? You know, because if you look at something like um, ballet, which obviously has a very long history, um, mm -hmm. ballet, there is a structure to it. If you walk into any dance studio in the country, you know, Every, every first position, second position, third position, fourth position, demi-plié, relevé, like it all looks the same. It all has the same technique to it. It all is taught the exact same way. And then choreography can change from studio to studio, but the structure of the dance is the same. Um, if you look at gymnastics, right, uh, the, there are certain moves, there are certain figures, there are certain... Um, mechanics of the movement that are structured in such a way that it doesn't matter if you're training in China or in Moscow or in New York, you're going to be learning it roughly the same idea within the same context. But as you just said, that's not the case with ballroom dancing. So. Well, we have, I mean, we have the position that we have the moves, we have the, the books written in a stone in international style a little bit less in the American style in the sense of uniform. There's only one book in Latin, one book in standard. So that's going to make it easier. But, um, well, I think it's, an, this sport comes more of the kind of artistic. So, and it's come to the point, I like this or I don't like this, or I like this better than this one. And you have so much possibility for expression and then inventing something different. And then it's only depend if people or judges, let's say, will like it. And then it can get some direction can be changed. So let's say between when I started and right now, it's quite different. Even in a position is different. The movement is, I mean, everything is just expanded. It's greater. And I think because of that, this like this or like that, it's so many opinion, then it's not maybe so easy to come the same way like in the gymnastic when you have certain. But I think gymnastic also progresses. It just only maybe not as wide and different. It just has its own shaping, but it always will somebody come and doing something different and then they're changing it. So I think it's, Possibly in the ballroom will be the same. We have quite a good structure in the sense of the there is a world dance council and then there is a national, so there is representation of the countries. So it's always kind of structured very nicely. There is different organization, of course. So there are let's say two or three of those. And but we have structure, the only is not not like any other sport. Yeah. So it's kind of mix of the sport and art. Definitely, definitely the mix of the sport and the art and how those two intertwine and diverge is always interesting. Um, what has been the biggest change that you've seen over the years? You mentioned that from where you started to where the, the dance is today that you 
see it growing and expanding. What's the biggest thing that kind of stands out in your mind as um, development over the last couple of years? Well, I think it's, um, it's become a little bit more complex in terms of the movement. I would say that there is more into the body movement in general. Let's say there is more, more usage of the range of the movement. And let's say in the ballroom, it's more shaping and in the lighting, it's a little bit more speed. So I think it's all changes. Not sometimes people like this, sometimes not. It's all depend. So because it's like if you will become too sporty, then it become also very athletic. And then maybe you will lose this point of artistry. So when you become maybe sometimes too artistic, you might be too artistic. And then you will lose that enough tone to do it. So it's always trying to improve, doing better, doing more, mm. but at the same time, not only that physical aspect should be. Um, what? You mentioned that you see it more being in the body. Can you elaborate on that when you say, what, what do you mean by when you're looking at dancing, it looks more in the body as in they're taking moments to be more internally aware or it's more in, in the person, in the couple? What, what visually is that kind of cue for you? I think it may be more internally aware. Say, say if we, can, we compare the video from the other, maybe it's just more pronounced right now that when you are dancing. So it's the body has more movement inside, let's say in the ballroom than it used to be before. So, and also in the Latin, it's, you know, it's more internal, but again, it's probably depend on the dancer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned before that you are dancing a lot more smooth, uh, obviously than you were previously because smooth hasn't really made its way over. Well, it's, it's starting to make its way over to Europe. We're starting to see the yeah. explosion, um, of that happening. So, uh, what about smooth? Do you like, what do you wish there was less of or more of what do you kind of see the direction of smooth moving in? Well, I would say that I really liked smooth. So I would probably not be an expert to say what I like or I don't like. I think it's everything about smooth is great. So it's a different style, which it has both being possibility to dance in close hold and also express yourself apart. And I think this is the good part of it. So I think it, generally I like smooth. So I don't think there is anything which I say I don't like about smooth. Um, when it comes to pro-am competitors, do you find that most of your students are drawn in a particular direction or like you said before, try all four styles and then see what they kind of like? Well, my students mostly either go in with a smooth or a standard, just like me, <laughs> mainly. Um, but again, then it depends on their preferences. So some of them just like to dance standard and that's it. And some of them like to dance standard and smooth. So both styles. Some of them dance only smooth. So it, then it's become more personal preferences or how much time they actually have in their hand. Because it's, if they want to be competitively good, so then they have to dedicate some more time because there is many good teachers, many good pro M students, and not so always easy to stay good in the finals. Yeah, that, that can always be a tricky conversation to have with students too, which is ones that are competitively motivated. Um, you know, is it advantageous to specialize in one style or because they like you know, standard and smooth, let's dance standard and smooth. Um, you know, the, the conversation of if the more styles or the more dances that you take on, the more time you have to commit to still having it at, at a certain level. And then also the uh, interesting way that competitions tend to be structured so that um, from competition to competition or event to event, depending on who, who's there, 
It could be a more difficult final or, or maybe an easier final, depending on your student. So um, especially as you move into, I feel like there are, and I'm going to try and say this as politically correct as I possibly can. Um, I feel like there are certain pockets and certain levels where um, people tend to, to live in for a while. They tend to enjoy their time at certain levels and certain checkpoints. So moving past and moving through those levels can be a little bit tricky if you are someone that, you know, really takes a second placement more difficult than a first. So how do you kind of have that conversation with your students? How do you mentally and emotionally prepare them for the ups and downs of competition? Well, the ups and downs have to happen, basically. So it's sometimes you doing better, sometimes not. Sometimes you have one set of competitors and you have different set of judges. And that's, that's I mean, even though we, the average is supposed to be very objective, not subjective, but let's say dancing one final with one set of judges and different final with second set of judges, then you can kind of, sometimes you can see if you're dancing on the top or maybe not making the final. So it's sometimes, again, it comes to the somebody like, somebody don't like, or whatever. There's a chant, right? Mm. So then the result cannot be guaranteed for sure that somebody will win or not. So I think dancing better, it's kind of good remedy for that. So if somebody dance well and dedicated and has the opportunity to dance more competition, to just be more recognizable because that's also part of it. When people dance more, they are more exposed to the judges and then it all work that way too. And I think NDC doing some good job with the trying to clean, clear all those pockets for people who are staying there too long, but it's still not so clear that how to do it because I think there is also say you have somebody who is dancing nicely and they just going into this silver let's say and they start to win left and right and in half a year I guess they're supposed to move on and then but the goal will become too hard so that's also something which it's not so easy to justify that if you win some competition you have to move uh, so I guess it will work. But I think in general that having that conversation that people staying for years in the same group should be changed. And I think what's, what is uh, working well, it's uh, adding the gold or promoting the close gold yep. division. It makes also better for the people to move, let's say, from the silver to the gold first and then from gold to open gold. Because in the open goal, there is nowhere to go. So okay. everyone is end up ending there and then they can compete for 20 years. And if they win 20 years, well, that's it's like in professional. Somebody stayed long and they're multi-time champions because the second couple might not be as good or, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's also tricky too, because obviously as instructors, you know, there's only one of us. So if you are an instructor that has many students that are all in the roughly the same age category or roughly in the same level category, you then have to kind of pick and choose and, you know, figure out what makes sense to, to get everybody the, the competition experience that they, that they want and that they wish for. Um, was there a moment when you were competing as an amateur or early in your professional career that you can kind of look back to a, a conversation with a coach or a judge or an instructor and say, you know, this conversation really set me on the path to, to getting where I am today, or this conversation really changed the way that I look at what I'm doing so that I can be better prepared for teaching or for competitions or for working with students. Well, probably it was accumulated over the years, not like in particular, let's say one conversation made a big turn. And I think I started to already teach a little bit early, well, relatively early, like in my twenties. 
because after dancing and, and competing, so it's usually that's how it works. First you compete and then you start in, because what's happening is if you involve in dancing 100%, so then your income has to come from the same source if you have to work. So then you start to teach and that's starting. So as you teach and you are learning your experiences, working with different students, teaching different couples. So that's, and also continue to work with different teachers and just um, making observation how they teach and how they making students to be motivated. So then you just kind of making the notes and over time it accumulates and shape you as a teacher, I think. Um, when you first came to the U.S., were you in Denver or did you start on the East Coast and then eventually move out here? I started on the East Coast and yeah, well, the transition was a little bit, well, I'm not say painful, but not so uh, easy. I guess um, a lot of um, teachers, the first thing they, the first speed bump, it's a language because it's not so easy to start right away to speak different language, unless they already have that fluent. So that will be probably the best. But what I like, let's say in the United States is that people are very friendly and they didn't really care much of if you don't speak well, but they were willing to help and was always very supportive. So that was great. So that's first I started on the East Coast. Okay. And then, um, so so you spend some time in the U.S., you kind of get acclimated to everything that is different about the U.S. Um, what what led you to Denver? How did you finally get to Denver? Well, I was for a while traveling in different places as a traveling coach, and that was kind of spread, it was uh, in Denver, it was in Virginia, and it was also in Costa Rica, and then in New Jersey, so I, I travel a lot, mm. but then I, at the some point I just, it just took some toll on me, because it's traveling every month in every place, it takes a lot of, I would say, effort in the terms of the being all the time on the road, so then I decided to, okay, it's time to just pick one place yeah. and I decided to go to Denver. So, so that's actually something that I don't think we've, we've kind of touched on yet is, you know, when we think of dance instruction, for most people, it is a brick and mortar studio that they have dedicated instructors or independent instructors that are based in a physical location. But there is this whole side to the dance sport industry of, like you said, traveling instructors. Um, so for you, how did you get into kind of becoming that traveling coach? Um, how did you structure? Were you doing, did you have ongoing cl uh, students and clients in those different locations or were you coming in and teaching like workshop and lecture series? What did that actually look like? Well, I was actually invited by studios into different locations. And over time I developed, I mean, not developed the clientele because it was a studious clientele, but I developed this, the relationship with the student that they like to compete with me and take lessons. So it's the studio for studios was very good. And for me it was very good. So it's everybody was happy at the end. So, and since it's this kind of collaboration worked very well, so I was going there a constant basis. So it was, um, because sometimes say you have coaches and they travel in also different places, but sometimes they travel into one place and then coming back, let's say in two, three, four months, or maybe next year, mm -hmm. depend on the coach, of course. Sometimes they are busy, they're not available that much. So sometime more. So it's developed some relationship with the studio owners and then it was for me, kind of possible to travel different places. And uh, also I had a constant, always clients who wanted to continue to dance and they don't mind to actually wait on one or two weeks. So kind of work this way. I was surprised to actually, but in terms of it was, I would say that it would be hard for student to wait for a long time, but 
I guess that was the best for them. They decided to do that. Yeah. So, so if you were traveling to say Virginia for a week to, to teach students and to train with them for competition, and then you weren't going to be back in Virginia for two or three weeks, were they just left on their own to kind of practice? Did they have an in-house instructor that they would work with that's kind of like a gap filler? Um, did it really just depend student to student, studio to studio? It's depend on studio to studio. Sometimes people just doing their homework and that's all. And sometimes they had different instructors, sometimes even for different styles. So they were busy with other stuff in the meanwhile. And well, it's, let's say, I would say that some dedicated pro M students, they actually used to travel to their instructors. So that if they have, let's say, they pick on some one instructor they want to compete with. So usually they deciding to come. And of course they come in once in a month or once in whatever their time is. And that's also working very well. Yeah. Do you think that with kind of the last year adding, um, having more people become aware of online format and, and the availability of online instruction that you will see more students that are willing to work with coaches that are in remote locations or in different locations around the country in that sense? Or do you think that it really won't have a long-term impact on how we seek out training and coaches? Well, personal training is always, in person is always much more beneficial because yeah. your coach next to you and can show you and actually do it with you. So I would say, that will be the always the most desirable way. Mm. Uh, what I think that was good for the pro M student with the Zoom, who was trying that actually they could figure out now that, okay, we need to do something on our own. So we have to learn what we do, how we do, become more aware about our own self when we're on the dance floor and be able to actually deliver it, not only because instructor is pushing us around the floor, or telling us what to do, if it's, let's say, if it's lighting or the smooth, but actually knowing what exactly they should do or they could do or have the better idea what they want to deliver. And I think that that part was really good. Yeah, so. yeah that's, um, that's definitely a component, I feel like, that amateur, especially youth amateur competition is trained a little bit more is having that individual responsibility of do you know your routines without your partner but in pro-am we kind of let it slip a little bit more it's like i got you i got you we'll let this go um and i i do i agree i think the last year has put a little bit more of that individual responsibility back on the students to make sure that they do have the technique and they do know what their routines are and they are moving themselves so it'll be interesting to see where it goes from here Yes. Yeah. Well, all my students I was uh, coaching on Zoom, they actually saw the benefits and they like them. But you're right. It's when, but again, at the same time, the person just only start to dance. The teacher is the only hope for them. Yeah. So then, of course, we have to just be a little bit patient with them to slowly develop their independence because sometimes they just need it. And at the time, it changes. Yeah. It's... And that's, that's time made them realize, okay, it has to actually change. Because if I know what I'm doing, I'm actually doing much better. <laughs> right, right. Well, and it feels so much better for both partners if you're both, you know, responsible for yourselves. You can give more to your partner that way rather than just relying on them. So, yeah. Well, excellent. Well, anything um, that you would like to leave our listeners with? Any words of wisdom or anything that we didn't get a chance to talk about that you want to make sure that they are thinking about as we move forward? Well, I would think that whoever will listen to us already connected to the ballroom world. And I think this is a great place to be because of the. Um, surrounding and the, all the community dancers. And I think it's a great place to be. 
So I think it's working on our, on themselves and, and developing their own dancing. It's always important and always ask, let's say, I like when my students asking me questions. That actually helps a lot in terms of understanding what they actually know or they don't know. Because sometimes we assume that students know always everything that we already told them. And in reality, it might not be the case. And I would say stay healthy for sure <laughs> for everybody. And uh, hopefully this is all going to come down and we will be able to do it like we did before. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. When, when your instructor asks you, do you have any questions? We promise we're not doing a pop quiz. We aren't like waiting eagerly for you to give us back the question that, that, you know, you, we know that you need to ask. We're opening that as an opportunity for you to clarify. We mean it genuinely. Excellent. Well, thank you, Yuri, so much for being a guest on today's podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you again to Yuri for being a guest on today's podcast. If you want to follow along with his dance journey, you can do so using the links in the description box below. As always, I'm Samantha. I'm your host with Love Live Dance. You can find the podcast versions of these episodes at ballroomchat.com, and you can follow us across social media at ballroomchat. If you've not already done so, please do make sure that you have hit the subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and turn on the bell so that you get notified every single time we post. As always, stay safe, stay positive, and we hope to see you dancing very soon.